Have you ever run across a set of records where something seems a little off? Take a look at these. This album is across three discs. Here's disc one, side one, and on the back is side six. The fuck? Side two is on the next disc? All right, then I suppose we should find side five on the back of this one, and yeah, sure enough, we do. Only this last disc has any semblance of normalcy. It seems like it ought to be disc two, seeing that it has sides three and four. But no, this is disc three. Did they just suck at numbers in the 60s? Well, a few people did, I'm sure, but in fact, this apparently bizarre numbering scheme is quite logical. You see, this record set was designed specifically to be used in an automatic record changer. Arranging the sides like this was often called automatic sequencing. Now, as someone who lived until the age of 13 or 14 before ever using any sort of record player, the idea of a record changer seemed laughable. See, I had grown up with one of these things. Those shiny things are called compact discs. They held music on them, and this is a compact disc changer. It's pretty neat. I did some videos on these things. Oh look, a card! So when I heard of record changers, I envisioned some really giant version of this. But in fact, record changers were nothing more than an ordinary looking phonograph save for two modifications. An extraordinarily long and funky spindle, and a weird floating arm thing. These things are certainly not rare by any means. In fact, they were pretty standard fare in homes from the 1940s through to the 1970s. They eventually fell out of favor, and audiophiles hate them! But in this video, I'd like to pay tribute to the cleverness that is the automatic record changer. Let's start with a field trip to the 1920s. By this point, we had already decided that cylinders were the Betamax of sound formats and were all in on disc. Only trouble was that the 78 RPM records of the day could only hold between 3 and 5 minutes of music per side. So, having just settled in listening to your favorite set of tunes, you'd quickly have to get back up and do some good old fashioned disc jockeying. Well that's no good, is it? So we humans, ever looking for problems to solve, set to work on enabling a more leisurely experience. If this website I found is to be believed, the first record changer with a design similar to this was invented by Eric Waterworth of Hobart, Australia in 1925. However, his invention never made it to market, likely due to difficulties in getting records to play upside down. The first record changer to really find a groove was the automatic orthophonic Victrola by our friends at the Victor Company. This design from 1927 used a rather precarious looking arrangement of stacked records held at an angle. A weird hoop thing would rise up, grab a disc from the stack, place it gently on the turntable, then it would be played once. And then the hoop thing would pick it back up and not so gently drop it down a padded chute. I mean it worked, but yikes. To give you an idea of how desperate we were for automatic record playing, the Victor VE 1050, the first and most basic model with the automatic changer, retailed for $600, which is worth about $9,000 in 2019 money. And if you think nobody bought them, you'd be wrong, as an estimated 12,000 of these things were produced in 1927 alone. We wanted automation, and we wanted it yesterday. But let's fast forward a few decades. Throughout the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, record changer development continued at a breakneck pace. Plenty of clever innovations made their way into the hands of consumers, as well as plenty of duds. But by the 1960s, and especially into the 70s, we had pretty much settled on this design. This Glenburn changer is one of many, many copies of the infamous BSR changer. If you bought any sort of stereo in the late 60s to mid 70s, odds are it had something really similar to this in it. I have heard both that Glenburns were considered cheap knockoffs and that they're better than your average BSR, so take that as you will. So, how does one use this clever contraption? Let's compare this rather standard turntable from Sony with our miraculous Glenburn. The Sony is a no surprises affair. You put the record on the turntable, and you put the stylus on the disc. That's about it. But this record player, there's, there's more to consider. There's this thing, and look at all these selector levers. I don't know, Winifred, this looks pretty complicated. Have no fear, as with a little knowledge and training, you'll find a record listening experience that's automatic beyond belief. First, lift the record stabilizer arm out of the way. Next, be sure to select the appropriate diameter of the disc you'll be playing. This standard LP is a 12-inch disc, so we'll set it to 12. Then, double-check the speed setting. 33 and a third, and how. Now that we have all the settings dialed in, we can place our record on the spindle. Uh-oh, it's all wonky! 
Not to worry. Reposition the record stabilizer, and we'll be just one step away. With our record sitting neat and pretty, simply switch on the turntable by moving the selector from stop to start, and then to auto. It will spring back to the start position, but don't worry, automatic operation is underway. Now your record automatically drops into place, and the tone arm travels to the outer edge to play it. Beautiful! When your record is over, the record player automatically returns the tone arm to the resting position, and even turns itself off. Plus, it secures the tone arm in place. What marvels we enjoy today! But wait, that's just a real Rube Goldbergian way to play a record automatically. What was the point of holding them up in the air like that? I'm glad you asked! The notched spindle prevents the disc from falling until this actuator moves to the left. This action both decreases the effective diameter of the spindle, allowing the disc to fall, and it also pushes the disc past the lip it was resting on. But, and here's the real kicker, thanks to this second piece, we can place another disc on top. When the bottom record is pushed off the ledge, the very piece that does the pushing prevents the disc above it from falling too. The result is a machine that will play a stack of discs automatically, one at a time. But last time the record player stopped when it was done playing. What's to keep it from doing that again? Why, the record stabilizer, of course! Notice how it rests higher than usual when braced against a record. This tells the record player that there's another disc to play. After the last disc has fallen, the lever drops down, and now it knows it's time to stop after this disc is done. It's just like magic! Well, it's not really like magic. <laughs> it sure is! The record- No. Stop it. We're done with that. This is actually one of the most basic designs of Record Changer, as they really peaked in performance in the late 1950s and early 60s. After that, many of their more advanced features dwindled away. For instance, many Record Changers could automatically determine the diameter of the discs, negating the need for this selector. Some did this by using the tone arm to deliberately bump into the edge of the disc it was about to play to determine its size. Other methods were used too, though a common theme with those machines was that mixed sizes of discs, if they were supported at all, had to be stacked largest to smallest. Not always, but usually. Can you see now why this record set has the sides in such a strange order? With this record player, it's not weird at all. If you stack three discs like this, with side one on the bottom, two in the middle, and three on the top, then it will play each of those sides in that order. Then, flipping the entire stack over plays the opposite sides in reverse sequence, so it will play side four, then five, and finally six. Automatic sequencing of records goes back pretty much as far as record changers have been available. These rather delightful Looney Tunes children's sets are auto-sequenced, and uh, they're from 1948. But certainly not everything was. Awkward pause as I reach for another set of records. These selections from Gilbert and Sullivan's HMS Pinafore are sequenced as normal. By the way, these things, they're called record albums. They're like photo albums, but they hold records. Before the advent of long play records, a group of songs was sold in one of these record albums, and that's where the name comes from. Fun fact! The most clever thing about these machines, at least from my perspective, is that their automatic functions are achieved using the same motor that spins the turntable. This record changer, along with the vast majority of others, is entirely mechanical. The tone arm's movement, along with the dropping of the next record, are driven off the turntable itself. In fact, with the record player unplugged, we can make it go through its automatic routines by simply turning it by hand. Thanks to the miracle of precarious rigging, we can watch what the mechanism does as it changes a disc. It's all just a bunch of cam drives pushing on this and pulling on that. This piece here is attached to the tone arm, and you can see how changing the size selector changes where the tone arm will stop. It's really a fascinating bit of engineering cleverness. The designers were aware that any sort of drag on the turntable is likely to introduce some wow and flutter, so the mechanism is effectively disengaged from the turntable unless some sort of automatic function is being performed. Of course, it's kind of impossible to convey this over video, but I can definitely feel that it's difficult to spin the turntable as it does its rigmarole, but as soon as the tone arm settles to where it would be playing a disc, the mechanism disengages and it becomes much easier to rotate. In fact, there's so little drag on the turntable, pretty much just the friction of the motor and idler wheel, that it takes a fair while to come to a stop. 
But as soon as the tone arm makes it to the center, it re-engages the mechanism, and now the turntable no longer spins freely. Actually, I suppose I can convey this over video. Here, it's spinning nice and fine, but as soon as it starts moving the tone arm, it quickly comes to a stop without the help of either my hand or the motor to keep it along. Of course, one of the downsides of this approach is that the speed of the changing is impacted by the RPM of the records you're playing in nearly all of these turntables. The movement is fairly graceful with long play records, but introduce some 78s like those Looney Tunes ones we saw earlier into the mix, and it gets real herky-jerky. These discs, by the way, are 10-inch discs, so I've put the selector into the 10 position. And of course, if you happen to have a set of spoken word or other records that play at the rather uncommon 16 and 2 thirds RPM speed, the once graceful movement becomes annoyingly slow. Finally. And now let's talk about why audiophiles hate them! First, let's address the simple truth that some audiophiles apparently are incapable of appreciating. Most humans will happily make sacrifices to quality for convenience. I feel that needs repeating with greater emphasis. Most humans will quite happily make sacrifices to quality if the experience is more convenient. If you value quality over all else, that is fine. We salute you in your pursuit of perfection. But do not judge your fellow humans for tastes that be different to yours, and do not try to convince us that our standards are too low. Also, what is convenient is in the eye of the beholder. That deserves consideration too. Alright, now that I've checked that off my list, let's start with the more tenuous concerns regarding record changers. Notice that as more records get stacked, the angle of the tone arm changes. This makes the angle at which the stylus sits in the groove not quite optimal, which may impact the quality of the sound coming from the cartridge. Blasphemy! Let's see how bad it really is, though. Here's what a record sounds like being played resting directly on the turntable. How about that? Pretty easy, isn't it? Red light comes on. Simply press stop. All right, and now stacked on top of five other records. Uh, how about that? Pretty easy, isn't it? I'll even switch back and forth repeatedly. Spot the difference. Yeah, I can't hear it either. Okay, then the other slightly more legitimate concern is that the act of stacking discs is just plain bad for them. I mean, you don't want to go around just touching the surface of a vinyl record. Surely letting them rub together when the stationary disc falls on the rotating one will result in a disaster. Well, not really. I mean, think about this for a second. The sound recording on a record isn't on the surface of the disc. It's below the surface, between the grooves. Sure, in theory, a big piece of dust or other debris might cause some sort of a scratch during the brief period of acceleration from stopped to moving, but generally, discs rubbing against each other proved to be pretty harmless. Again, the only parts that touch under normal circumstances anyway are the tops of the groove walls, which don't actually contain any of the sound. The one bit of damage that was known to occur, and quite frequently mind you, was a bit of chewing up on the label right around the hole, especially for the discs on the bottom of a tall stack. You might potentially have the weight of four or five vinyl, or even shellac, records resting on just this little shelf. And when the disc gets pushed off of it, that might do some nasty things to the label. But I mean, when you imagine a record as a delivery medium for the day's popular music, and not a fragile collector's item to be protected, who cares? No, seriously, now you'd shout bloody murder over the wearing down of the center hole, but back when this was popular, not so much. 
Nevertheless, the general public did eventually grow to view these as less than ideal for the preservation of their discs. It took a great long while though, as remember, until the 1970s, a record changer was more or less the norm. I think a few things contributed to their demise. First was the fact that the truly elegant designs of the 50s and 60s were standardized into these cheaper, ineloquent hunks of okay, I guess. By the 1970s, record changers had become pretty mediocre. Sure, they worked fine, and honestly, this one sounds very nice, aside from the fact that it runs ever so slightly too fast, which infuriates me. But by the 1970s, changers just weren't very good record players, and very good record players, almost without exception, weren't changers. Additionally, the market was moving away from monstrous console systems, which these would fit nicely into, to more compact bookshelf and component systems, meaning the extra height and bulk of the changer suddenly became a disadvantage. And lastly, and I'll admit this is just me musing about human tendencies, I think they just went out of style. You gotta admit, this Sony unit is a whole lot sleeker looking than its Glen Burn counterpart. Yeah, it's quite a bit newer, but without a tall spindle and the extra depth required for the mechanism, it could save quite a bit of space in the Z dimension. But regardless of who or what killed the changer, I hope we can appreciate its cleverness for a little while longer. I especially like the automatic sequencing. In my eyes, it's almost like a hack. And one other thing I didn't mention about that, even on a manual turntable, assuming you're willing to stack your records, it's arguably more convenient. Play side one, then put two on top of it, then three on top of that. Flip the top record over to play four, flip the top two to play five, and flip the whole stack to play six. I suppose though, if you're unwilling to let the vinyl get a little cozy with its partners, then yeah, it's a pain in the ass. Oh, and although we shunned the idea of stacking, turntable automation didn't die out completely. Fancier turntables could start a record automatically with the press of a button. And while that's a little advanced for this guy, he's still happy to return the tone arm for you and shut off. And of course, it also uses the movement of the turntable to provide the movement of the tone arm. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this video. Now comes the time where I thank the fine folks who support the channel on Patreon, with a special thanks going to the people scrolling down your screen. Your support has really been a life changer, and it's making sure there's always another video waiting to drop. If you'd like to join these people in supporting the channel, check out my Patreon page. Thanks for your consideration, and I'll see you next time. That was real! Yes! <laughs> On the word drop. No video fakery this time. <laughs> I promise that was actually real. I'm so, if you can't tell by the smile on my face. Uh, yes! Let's compare this rather standard turntable. I used the hand motion wrong. Other methods, other, uh, that was a really good take and we screwed it up. Then it will play each of those dips. Should have thought that through, Jared. That's right, Clover. You're just coming up with names on the spot. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. Yes, I am. <laughs>